this podcast could potentially have adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly the possibility of sexual content. <clears throat> Listener discretion is advised. to Drinking With Authors, the podcast. I am your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is the amazing Mark Muncy from Erie, Florida. Actually, from Erie Travels, I should yeah, say. Yeah, I was going to say, we've Erie expanded Travels. now. Yes. So. And um, our guest today is Jeffrey Falcon Lowe. Woo! Okay, welcome, Jeffrey. Let's talk about what we're drinking. For those of you who are listening or watching, you may be able to hear that I have a little bit of a sore throat today. Brought that back from my granddaughter's first birthday. Yay, presents little kids Yay. give you. Um, so I'm actually drinking um, a hot toddy, in, which is whiskey, lemon, honey, and hot water in a cup a friend of mine gave me, and I'm not even kidding about this, 30 years ago. It's a 30-year-old mug. Jason, love your face. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mark, what are you drinking? Oh, I have from drink uh, from our wonderful friends of Drinking with Authors. We have Coffee Shop of Horrors, Ichabod's Dame, uh, because it is a little chilly here in Florida. The iguanas are falling out of the trees, so I went with a little pumpkin spice uh, warmth since I am the designated driver today. So, <laughs> so keeping the Halloween alive. Cheers! I, I love the candy corn mug. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey, what are you drinking? Well, I'm having this delicious mix of water and vodka. I like it. I like it. Is it a flavored water or we just put water in our vodka? It's it's just normal water with with a little decent amount of vodka in there, let's just say. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm in uh, Carolina, South Carolina myself, so it's a bit chilly outside. And honestly, I... Got to use this uh, Disney World German beer mug <laughs> I picked up <laughs> down there, and uh, it keeps I me love that. And keeps me hydrated. I like it. I like it. it yeah, it's. Um, it I'm in North terrible. Carolina, and right now my app's about to tell me it's 42 degrees, and there is Mark snow on the ground. So there was frost in Clearwater this morning. So that's yeah, you know, which means frost. that you know there were a lot of you know near suicides and it was terrible so <laughs> yeah, i believe it i believe it okay so jeffrey for those of um our audience that maybe don't know you what do you write so i primarily write fantasy and sci-fi and specifically i write dungeon core it is a genre i actually uh started myself uh on Very amazon cool. It way back in the early days of 2016. Way back then. Yeah, that's before, before, live back then. Before the cold times. Yeah, I hate to say that that seems so like so long ago. It really does, though. With everything we've gone through the last three uh, years, that seems like yeah. so many moons ago. Uh, so just a quick explanation that Dungeon Core is a subgenre of lit rpg if, if either of you have sort of heard of that oh yeah it's, absolutely um, yeah. yeah familiar the uh i was uh i like to call myself the youngest of the oldest because a lot of the uh the authors around that time got together and formed that facebook group and then it's just grown from there and now that it's, it's a whole thing that's even starting to be recognized by the greater media out there but Dungeon Core specifically is the story from generally the perspective of the dungeon. So like the physical location has an opinion on what the heck's going on inside of it. And there's That's all so sorts of, of flavors of that. Very cool. So what have you, first of all, have you always written or were you a gamer that took on this perspective? Like where did the sort of genesis of this concept come in for you as a writer 
Hmm. I would probably say uh, depression. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was. I actually was in college uh, for a genetics major. And oh, wow. You know, you go to college and you do well with science all your life. Everybody tells you, oh, yeah, science. You're good at it. You're good at it. And you end up like, oh, I hate science. I hate lab, lab reports. But, uh, you know, it gave me a reason to sort of look for places, right, to, to mm -hmm. relax in. Have either of you ever heard of a website called Royal Road Legends? No. 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 Oh, do explain. Uh, it is, it was originally a website for uh, translation, uh, specifically it, it did the translating of the legendary Moonlight Sculptor, which is a Korean web novel, or, yes. well, one of those three categories, web novel, et cetera, uh, but then they sort of transitioned into being a hosting site for people to just write and post things, it's kind of like uh Oh shoot! Now, now the name just escapes me. Even though I smash words or or the likes of that. Oh yeah. And back then, I was reading a lot of things, and the sort of proto idea of Dungeon Core was on there by other authors. But the problem was that those stories were never finished. They either ended up getting overpowered too quickly, so the story got boring or they were just boring to begin with. So not even the author wanted to finish that. There were some exceptions, but they were usually the God complex kind of novels, right? The, the literal God controlling the lives and watching the civilization grow, like playing Civilization VI. Uh, ah. But I decided to finish it and I chose my main monsters as slimes because at the time, slimes as a monster weren't really big or well known that is yeah. very much changed with the rise of anime like that time we got reincarnated as a slime and games like slime rancher yeah but but at the time it was it was unique and i wrote it and i kept at it and it actually got like top fiction of the month and some other couple millions of views and i just took that and that sort of encouragement and i published and from there, I would say a lucky break, but I could also acknowledge that I had to drop out of college because my gallbladder had been hit with a shotgun, is how the doctor described it to me with the <laughs> gallstones. So I took advantage of that semester off. I wrote the second book and published it, and that started doing really well. So I ended up changing my major to creative writing and eventually graduating with uh, my books under me and that sort of paved my way ever since very yeah. cool so um is uh this the dungeon core let me make sure i'm saying it right dungeon core i've learned something new on this podcast uh mark have you already yeah yeah seriously so how does a story like this sort of go and transpire like I've just got to ask because telling, you know, the the story from the the building or the dungeon or the whatever, like the physical structure ish that something's in, how how does that even go? What is like overview of how you write a story like that? Well, so I'm sure people are listening going, how the hell do you tell the dungeon side of the story? I was gonna say that's usually the first three paragraphs of the module is just the history of the dungeon and then the story. So I'm curious. Well, uh, it's it's evolved pretty well since I published the first one. In fact, I plan on, I would say in maybe two books, I'm going to actually rewrite my original uh, quadrilogy, let's call it. Uh, and it'll, it'll be much uh, more with uh, my modern writing experience as opposed to somebody writing something, not necessarily for the first time, but it has early author-itis is what I call it. Well, you know what? Everything we publish in the beginning has early authoritis. None of us walk in publishing like great to begin with. You know, you just got to go because even after you start redoing those, you'll still be a better author at the end of those than you were at the start of redoing them. So, yep. Yep. You're right. Um, 
so the way I sort of approached it was I took I the only creative liberty I took was that the dungeon that I was writing about was unique in that it actually had a human soul from 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 this world from our world but with without the memories just the knowledge and sort of some emotional growth so I did take that liberty and from there when I was first writing the first problem you run into is well a monologue is a very boring story if it's got to carry the whole plot yeah so my solution to that was that I created an entire race of pixies and I called them dungeon pixies and they essentially serve in the story as the teachers for for the dungeons of this world. Uh, in the literature sense, they're essentially the foil to the dungeon, right? The the opposite, the one who doesn't who is the individual uh, and does not have the same power as the dungeon, but does have all the knowledge. So sort of like the wall to bounce ideas and, and things off of, and the means to communicate how things work to both the dungeon and the reader. Uh, and I've, I've grown that since then. Now Dungeon Pixies are a unique race that have a inherited contract in their bloodline so that when they reach a certain age, they will ping with a dungeon that has developed to a certain point around the continent or the world, and they'll just automatically teleport there. And if that other dungeon agrees to this contract, then there is the, the pixie gets a home in the dungeon by which to live for protection and to have, raise a family and the dungeon gets guidance. And there's, there's some political shenanigans after so many centuries, right? The biggest dungeons have a family of pixies that sort of inherit the role through the generations and some other fun stuff, but that, that all came later. I just started out with, this is a pixie who just is the one who's talking and explaining things. Then for the dungeon, the day-to-day -day stuff, it's a mix of designing, sort of the, the dungeon master aspect of it. And I recognize the irony of, of that particular phrasing. Mm -hmm. And then I also included the other half where it's the perspective of those entering the dungeon. So what effect does the adventurer have on the dungeon and what effect does the dungeon have on the adventurer? And I think I found a pretty good balance. It certainly carried for the first four books and other authors followed me and they refined that formula even further. I went on myself and I did other things that were, that were evolutions of that same idea. With my last main series that I finished being the dungeon was inside the human body as opposed oh. to an actual place. So think Osmosis Jones plus Dungeons and Dragons. Love it. Uh, what is that movie, Mark, where they shrunk and Dennis Space? Inter Inner Space, yeah. 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 Okay, that's what that made me think of. So <laughs> I thought of body wars at Epcot back in the old days. So yeah, no, that's really really neat. So I'm assuming you were a gamer beforehand. Still am. Actually, I've been sort of working on my own video game for a while. Nice. Very cool. Well, so what do you think of this whole TSR thing that's come out? <laughs> I think that. One, it was a stupid idea, especially one that was, I just don't understand how anybody thought that, hey, everybody will be perfectly fine with this. But I also recognize that there's just a huge blowout and exaggeration on some of the issues that are, that are sort of glossed over because the actual thing that's, that made everybody mad is just so big. And honestly, they walked it back, but it's not the most honest walk back statement I've ever seen. This it's just covered in political language. I'm like, 
okay, it, the lawyers gave this. Okay, whatever. It, it reminded me so much. It is, it is the summary. It reminded me so much of uh, the end of uh, Thor Ragnarok when Jeff Goldblum's like, hey, great revolution. And I helped because I was the guy you had to overthrow. And that's exactly what it, the Wizards of the Coast statement sounded like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, I recognize Hasbro probably yeah. was really forcing all of that. And yeah. Wizards of the Coast is just getting all the flack because it's their name. But oof. oh, I, I don't know that, that the people at Wizards of the Coast don't sue me aren't unfortunately um i don't think they are still the gamers that created you know level level levels back of game i don't think that's who we're dealing with anymore they're a I, for profit I machine Jeremy crawford and the like but i'm not yeah, sure about others crawford and perkins maybe but yeah uh so my question is since you are a gamer what you know and you've done and this is dungeons are you know based on games what do you find yourself referring to the most since you know you know what classic games are you pulling from or more modern games honestly the truthful answer would be i should pull more is probably the the proper answer for instance i didn't know dungeon keeper was was even a thing before oh, yeah. you know i started marketing at say dragon con and i heard about it and the only thing i knew dungeon keeper of was a crappy mobile game i, I downloaded and played once that was just horrendously aggressive toward yeah. microtransactions and i was like yeah this this isn't fun so i was like oh it was actually a good game back in the day yeah, as an aggressive Dungeon Keeper fan of the first two, I agree with you on that mobile game, but the first two were amazing. That was immediately what I thought of when you were talking about this. I was like, wait a minute, the heart of the dungeon, all this. I was like, wait a minute. Right, this is very right, familiar. right. So that's, I was, that's see, why I was kind of leading that I wondered if you had done that. But I, I honestly need to play them just, just to see, one, if the similarities, two, if I can get interesting new ideas. But uh, I'm, I can proudly say that I just pull a lot, most of it out of my butt it's all all original even if somebody else did it oh yeah that that happens it's no totally were you a dungeon master when you gamed or were you player mainly i i'd say player because i did not start playing dungeons and dragons until i entered college and that was the first thing i ever wrote on aurora road it just sort of chronicled the the adventures of uh, of the campaign which i completely screwed up for that poor dungeon master because one i didn't understand that you could you can't use level nine spells when you are level nine that was my, <laughs> that was my mistake uh so that was its own thing and then second we were supposed the whole the first mission was just going to a base of hydras right so what do we do? We exit the Underdark, because that's where they were. We sort of find, okay, I'm fairly certain that raised mound over there is the top of the Hydra nest. So what do we do? We take our Minotaur companion, and we do magical shenanigans with him. We enlarge him, we reduce his weight, and magically throw, along with his jump, into the air, which we then reversed into greatly increasing his weight as he punches down at an, essentially the DM just sort of looked at us. I believe he was using either the second or third rules. And he said, well, you caused like a 6.0 earthquake and just completely destroy the Underdark all around you for like a 20 miles. Did we kill the Hydras? They are just dead. And then it just, no, it was I learned a lot and I've come a long way from that. Wow. Were you invited back to play? <laughs> <laughs> well, once the campaign was over, no, not really. It got worse. Uh, but to be fair, I think just he couldn't do it anymore either. It wasn't just <laughs> No, that makes sense. It takes a lot to be a good dungeon master for any sort of a game master. 
because you have to be able to think on your feet when your characters start doing ridiculous stuff like that and figure right. out how to do that or nerf their characters so they go a certain way and that's always very interesting so switching your major from a medical science major to creative writing like what were you trying to be when you grew up originally I would say that my changes evolved and I would call that quite literally. First, as a little kid, I liked rocks and collecting rocks. Then I liked fossils. Then I liked dinosaurs. Then I liked lizards. And then I learned herpetology was not a discipline any college taught, which was a great disappointment to me. Uh, so I sort of just switched over to just general science. I went into my freshman year actually for computer science, and I did learn a little bit, but it wasn't for me at the time. So I just switched to bio, and then when I changed colleges, I just went to genetics because this is a fast rising major. This is, you know, it's going to make you money. You'll never not be without a job. With, of course, the unsaid things like, man, I hope you really love doing lab reports and all that entails. You want to do some titrations? <laughs> so creative writing comes into play. Right. I've always just liked stories. The, uh, well, RPGs are is usually my game of choice, but I've all, I, I collected Legos and Bionicles, and then I would always, you know, make things and have these epic adventures in my room, and, you know, just just fun things that I would do. But, you know, I was always I was always told that's really cool. Go learn something that'll make you money. Right, not maliciously, right? But you know, how many people can 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 make a living as a writer compared to the many who want to? No, it's true. It takes quite a bit and a lot of work to do that, make a living. And then you have to define what make a living means no. because you will probably never be a gazillionaire as an author. Like even the authors you think are gazillionaires, there's a few of them, but not that many. Right. You know, I would say a handful, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um but that's that's really interesting that you chose to go down that path we actually have to take a quick break and we will be right back with more questions sample locally sourced quality distilled spirits in the beautiful columbia river gorge at skunk brothers distillery we're family owned brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits just like our grandfather did back in the prohibition era from handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers Spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits located in Stevenson, Washington. So we're back to um, how you don't really make money with creative writing, but I, th I definitely think you can. So how many books have you published now? Define books. Because I have some like novellas and anthologies. Those are books. Okay. Uh, I believe either 19 or 20. Nice. Very cool. Very well done. Um, have So how are you published? Are you self-published basically? Self-published uh, only on Amazon pretty much. Okay. Do you get physical copies of your books? Yep. Uh, I would right now all of my my big books have physical and audio editions. Nice. Oh, that had to be interesting. How did you approach the audio books? I've, I've approached it three different ways. The first way was me just trying it out on Amazon myself through uh, Audible. And honestly, 2017 was a much different environment uh, compared to the day. And so I actually didn't finish that yeah uh, my first five books were done by tantor if you've ever heard of that audiobook company yep 
yeah. they they approached me. They offered in advance and you know, like ten years, I believe. Which you know, for a for a poor college student, I was like, yay. Uh, but honestly, they don't do any marketing at all, so that was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, but my most recent book, which I published in September during Dragon Con. Uh, yeah, actually is uh, is being done by Podium, and uh, I'm really excited to see what they do with that. Oh wow! Oh, sorry if you hear dogs. Um, that's very cool. Yeah, no, you'll find a lot of places will do things they won't necessarily um, uh, promote. No, right. You know, yeah, so that's why I'm excited about Podium. They they actually had a panel all to themselves for Dragon Con. They they do a really good job on the marketing front. So in the in the lit RPG space, we've had a couple of uh, publishing companies come into being from you know some of the successful authors, and then a couple of audiobook companies have, have also come in, Podium being one of them, and they've just done an, a really great job just connecting with the community is what I would say. Which is what needs to happen, a very connected community. So you said you're working on a game? Yes. Tell us about it. Well, it is a slime game. It is a Metroidvania slime, uh, really what I would call it. Uh, the name is Slime Evo, and I've been working on it for about five years now. Pixel art, uh, the slime can get stronger through finding ability stones and also evolving and into different elements. And then each element you could learn like a different dodge move or a different attack move. Uh, I've had to put it on the back burner for since summer, unfortunately. I was really aiming to get out a full demo, if not an early access release in August, but it, <sighs> I have just been hurt by COVID and other world. My artist is from Ukraine. So oh, wow. yeah, I lost two programmers because they just got too sick to work. I lost my main artist because of war, which is terrible. And it, I just haven't been able to rebound fast enough for the budget to keep in pace with. It takes right it takes time for a programmer to learn thousands of lines of code for a ninety percent done project. So it's it's temporarily on hold. It's playable. I took it to Momocon uh, last year in May, and got a lot of positive, only positive feedbacks. So that was really nice. But I I am just loath to release anything that I don't believe is good enough. I'm I'm. I have that problem with my writing too. I'm too much of a perfectionist. Well, you got to be careful of that because you won't get work out the door if you're too much of a perfectionist. Right. right? I mean, unfortunately, that's mm -hmm. like one of the Achilles heels. What about, um, so you said you released only on Amazon. What made you decide to do that? Well, because I don't really know anything else, honestly. At, at this point in my career, I could probably, you know, look out and find other places, and I know of other places, but I'd be giving up that, that Kindle Unlimited money. Well, hey, if the Kindle Unlimited, Unlimited money is good for you, that's great. For some people, Kindle Unlimited money is great, and for other people, it's like 0.004% every, right. you know, month. So, yeah, it's, you know, when, uh, when Sanderson made his big post about not publishing through Audible, I was, I was just clapping, you know, I was like, ah, yes, golf club. Yes, please shine some light on this issue. Uh, but yeah, Amazon is just the big fish in the, in the small, but expanding pond of, of indie authors, I, I would say. No, it's true. I mean, it's the gorilla in the room. I, you know, yep. and I, I can tell you, I'm so glad there are other platforms coming out besides just Audible. I mean, Audible is great, but ACX is terrible. Yeah, like, I did not terrible. enjoy it. Mm. 
that. You know? But, um, so you went to Dragon Con. Were you a panelist or anything or just a visitor? Uh, I've been a panelist for the last three years, I want to say. Definitely two. Well, okay, so COVID kind of throws off my schedule a little yeah. bit. I, I they had to cancel one, I they maybe canceled two, but I've at least been a panelist for two. And then, uh, okay, so the third time I asked, and I, they put me on a panel <laughs> just because they needed a, a, a body to fill the seat. <laughs> uh, I've been, do, I've do had that? a booth at Dragon Con since 2017. Oh, very cool. In Artist Alley? No, no, no. Uh, I say I've had a booth. I had a booth in 2017. And then I couldn't afford to do it because go back to the college student part. But I got picked up uh, by James Hunter, who was with me at the time. Who uh, he's, an, he's another author for Viridian Gate Online, and then he's now also the one of the owners of Shadow Alley Press. Uh, so they they still have that booth spot, and they uh, they've been using it. I have been hanging out with the right, with the ladies on the first floor. It's a booth that uh, Cheryl Wilson. Uh, that's the one you uh, I picked up your card from, uh, and she 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 has a rotating thing with authors. And I'm, I've been with her for a while. I, I like being in the booth with her. Nice. Very cool. So what was it like when you had your first fan interaction? Shock. <laughs> so what happened? Well, so I had an anime con in Asheville, North Carolina. Very cool. It was, it was a terrible, I did a terrible job with that booth, but I had no idea what I was doing. So I did a decent job for not knowing what I was doing. And I had uh, some books out, but I didn't have anything, right? No background. I didn't have any table banners beyond the one that was provided. And somebody came up and said, I heard you were going to be here and I'd like a book. And I was like, Oh my God! Somebody knows me. It didn't help. Oh wow! I, think I was the only booth in that section. There was just a bunch of empty tables. Well, that had to be uh, cool. What? It was, um, so we'll go back to slimes, since that seems to be a theme here. Uh, what? What? What slimes? Uh, do you know? Have you you know, referenced again? Going back with your gaming, you know, background and stuff. What are What are some of the ones that you? feel are underrepresented. Well, so. <laughs> when I was first considering the monster, the only slimes that I were aware of were the Dragon Quest slimes from the Dragon Quest games from Japan, and then the oozes from traditional D&D. Uh, and I didn't really like either one. The Dragon Quest ones were goofy, but the oozes were, were too simple in my opinion. So I, there, there probably was other examples of this at the time I'm just unaware of, but I came up with the idea of a slime being a gelatinous creature with a solid rock core that was essentially the actual slime and the gooey stuff, the acidic stuff around it was just sort of a protective coat that the rock sweated essentially. And then it could manipulate at will using mana or magic whatever medium um, Very so then I, I actually still have it this giant flow chart tree chart of like over a hundred different slime evolutions i think uh, over 150 actually at this point because i add them on every once in a while like okay so this is a fire slime what can that become okay i mean what ability does this particular one have and uh, so on and so forth so I'm, yeah, I, I reference that a lot <laughs> when I'm thinking about slimes and abilities. Very so, so with, cool. with world building then, you know, you are, are these all one world, the, all these series or are they multi? Uh, I would say that my, certainly my mo most popular series 
books, they're all part of what I call the slime verse, because the first book is the slime dungeon. A uh, bit more complicated than that nowadays. Uh, I even actually, my current editor, when I first hired her, all she had for me was questions on how things work. And I had to type it for her. So eventually I just ended up with an entire book of just answering these world building questions. And I just went ahead and published that just for the heck of it. Doesn't make any money, mind you, but it is a pretty good <laughs> world building source that I just refer back to and, and add on to. Very cool. Very cool. So have you spawned an actual role playing game out of your uh, world yet? Not yet. It's it's something I'd like to do. Maybe maybe less so with the Dungeons and Dragons stuff going around right now. <laughs> but through the years, I've had people talk to me about it. And in fact, this time last year, I was working with the guy who was designing the nice lines to work in a Dungeons and Dragons challenge rating level. And we got a couple of those done and they were nice. So ideally, I'd like to you know, maybe not like a book or maybe a compendium on how the slime monsters work at the very least. Uh, anything more than that? I have the world building for it, but I, I just don't think I have the audience necessarily to support all the work that would go into it. So what are your reviews like when people write reviews for your book? So my big books have a good number of reviews and ratings not really as happy with the ratings because they don't do anything to the amazon algorithm anymore but uh and most people who leave a review like the idea uh back in the day it was certainly original and a lot of people were willing to overlook a lot of that new authoritis because of that these days if if I get a review on one of my original books, it'd be usually like, wow, the editing is trash. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had no money. Um, but uh, on the Bio Dungeon ones, for instance, my newest completed series, the reviews were, were definitely more in-depth. And I'm skipping over the ones that just said, hey, I like this, or hey, this was garbage, and you shouldn't read. I'm like, okay, just going to ignore this. That one star, I really appreciate, by the way, but uh, <laughs> they say, hey, I really like you, your use of characterization, and I really like your, your novel idea, right? They're, most, most if not all of my books have some unique idea in there that people enjoy. Uh, I don't really get as many reviews saying, hey, I really like your monster ideas and things, which I think is a bit of a shame, considering the work I put into it. But uh, if, I, if they're happy with how I've written my characters and how the, the story flows from low plot point to major plot point to climax, it, that's, it's, that's usually how it goes. And I'm, I really appreciate those because I can feel good about those reviews. What about people coming to meet you in person and seeing you on panels talking about it? Do you get into really in-depth conversations? with your fans around some of this stuff? Well, I usually only go to Dragon Cons. And at this point, I don't really see new fans at this point. I, I usually have met fans I've met before and they still like my stuff. Uh, I did go into a in-depth conversation with another author at Dragon Con who is a fan of my stuff. And we're actually uh, working on a collab right now. Nice. Uh, and we still have that conversation. Hey, how does this work? And I'll give him like several paragraph answer. So that's always fun to do. I like answering world building questions because then it's like, hey, I've written it down. Nice. Oh, very cool. Okay, Mark, I'm going to give you the final question. I have two questions and then you're going to have the epic final question. All right. My first question is, uh, so what are you right now working on? I am putting the finishing touches on my latest book. Sorry, the camera keeps going down for some reason. 
called Hungry Dungeon. It is a slime verse story, and the dungeon here is a food centric dungeon. This, uh, I have real world recipes that I've fantasized. No, that's not the right word. Fantasized? Anyway, I've made them <laughs> fantasy versions of themselves in it. And the, the dungeon here is just a place that can literally appear anywhere. Just you find, you defeat a monster, you find some unusual plant that you can eat, and it will appear and offer a trade that you can trade that ingredient for the ability to visit the dungeon once a week and enjoy a meal there. The, uh, the meal either being the daily offered meal or you go into the dungeon itself and you hunt the ingredients yourself. So all the ingredients the dungeon trades with, it can now create that monster or that plant or whatever inside of itself in the different biomes that you can now go hunt if you ever want to have a, a particular meal. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. And then my other question for you is, do you ever think about going out of this particular very, very uh, small genre? And it's not bad, but it's not like you go It's fantasy. very niche, it's like, yeah. Ah! You know, this is like, hello. So <laughs> do you ever think about jumping out of that into something else? So my last book uh, that I published during Dragon Con actually was kind of that. It's a sci-fi which is already already outside my major wheelhouse. And it does have some dungeon element to it, but it's more a corporate... Uh, so take The Office, Babylon 5, and Portal, and put them together. Oh, wow. So the, the space station is sentient. But it's uh, it's about the humans and they are sort of what's what's the word? Not Shanghai, uh, press pressed? No, no, I'm just going to use press pressed in the service because the station can only operate if there's people, and it can only operate properly if there's a board of directors. So now this crew is the board of directors, but they're also the grunts who have to do all the actual physical labor and so on and so forth and I, I really enjoyed writing that very it, it, it is everything you you sort of want in a sci-fi and if you just wanted to read stupid corporate shenanigans very cool very cool okay mark over to you my friend all right if you could visit any dungeon real unreal fiction or or real world dungeon where would you go and why I would visit that hungry dungeon I described to you <laughs> because you, you you also can't actually die. If you die, which you can still feel immense pain and however, however, you know, you end up, uh, you just respawn back inside the tavern lair and you just don't get to eat. But uh, considering the just sheer number of possible meals you could get out of there, I'm like, yeah, I got hungry writing this book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good thing, right? Awesome, awesome. So, okay, shameless self-promotion time, Falcon. Where do we find you? Okay, so you can find me on Amazon under Jeffrey Falcon Loeb. Uh, my website is www.slime-verse.com, and that has links to books and some of my video game stuff there. And you could also join the Dungeon Core Facebook page, which is Dungeon Core, as in C-O-R-P-S. I wanted to be corpse. Nobody liked that idea. And uh, that's where you can primarily find me and then all the other dungeon authors who have gathered with me to, uh, to write all sorts of unique and interesting stories. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Thank you for inviting me and with my nasty water vodka. Oh, I, I appreciate your nasty water vodka and the tasty <laughs> cup. Guys, this has been Drinking with Authors. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Please leave comments, reviews. We love to hear them. Um, my co-host today has been Mark Muncie, and we will see you guys next time.